Yo, here we go. We're going to do question four from the 2018 AP Calculus AB exam. Solved little question. Gives you a table of values for some function H. Notice right away the units. H is in meters and T, your independent variable, is in years. So they're not giving you a rate here. Something to keep in mind. It says the height of the tree at time T is given by a twice differentiable function H. So first off, that says that H is differentiable, right? So we know that, and we also know then if a function is differentiable, it must be continuous as well, and we're probably going to need to use that at some point in the problem. It says H of T is measured in meters. You can see that in the table. T is measured in years, and then you just have selected values given. All right, so let's rock and roll. So it says use the data in the table to estimate h prime of 6. So in other words, estimate the value of the derivative specifically at t equals 6. It says use, using correct units, interpret the meaning of h prime of 6 in the context of the problem. All right, so this is standard issue stuff right here. If you're given a table of values for h and you want to estimate the derivative uh, at a particular value 6, you're trying to figure out, well, where does 6 fall, right? 6 would fall somewhere right smack dab in the middle between 5 and 7. So what you can do is you can find the slope of the secant line that basically connects these two points, and that is going to be an estimate for the value of your derivative. So you would say something like h prime of 6 is approximately equal to, right, the slope of the secant line, which is going to be, and we'll write it this way, h of, oops, erase that, h of 7, right? minus h of 5 over 7 minus 5, okay? So in other words, h of 7, that's 11, minus h of 5, which is 6, over 7 minus 5. Probably don't need to show this right here. You can go straight to finding the change in y over change in x, uh, but whatever I did. So you get 11 minus 6, so that's going to be 5, and then over 7 minus uh, 5, you're going to get 2. So you get 5 over 2 or 2 and a half. You can leave it as 5 over 2. Now, what would the units be? Units are pretty easy, right, to get for the derivative. It's always the y unit divided by the x unit. So your numerator here, that stuff's measured in meters, right? And your denominator here, that stuff's measured in years. And so you're going to get meters per year, right? It has to be a rate, right, because we're estimating the derivative. So now it says interpret the meaning of this, right? So when you're given interpretation to the meaning of, of a derivative, in graphical sense, it's the slope of the tangent line. In context of a problem, it's instantaneous rate of change, right? So you could say something to the fact that at t equals 6, right, what do we know? If we know a derivative is positive, then its function is increasing. So at t equals 6, we know that h is increasing, because the derivative was positive, at approximately, because this was an estimate, 2.5 meters per year, okay? And that's a solid way to, uh, to explain it. All right, so that's that. So that's that question, no big deal. Let's go on to the next question. It says, explain why there must be at least one time t, all right, for this open interval, right, such that the derivative is equal to 2. So that should look an awful lot like the mean value theorem to you. So again, this won't be a part of the problem. This will just be like a note or a recall, right? This smells like a mean value problem theorem, so it's probably a mean value the uh, uh, theorem problem. So remember how that works. So you have some function, right, which we normally call f, and maybe now I'll call it h, right? We normally call this x, and maybe now I'll call it t, okay? And we look at the slope of the secant line of that function over some interval a, b, right? If, and this is a big if, if this function is smooth and continuous, so in other words, it's differentiable and continuous over this interval, then there's got to be at least one spot, uh, I'll call it C, within this where the slope of the tangent line would equal the slope of the secant line, okay? That is basically your mean value theorem. In layman's terms, it's the idea of that, hey, if you go on a car trip and you average 100 miles per hour over the length of interval of that car trip, 
And there had to be at least one instant in time within that car trip that you did 100 miles per hour. That should make a lot of sense to you. Unless, of course, you're teleporting, uh, in which case your timeline, your function would not have been continuous and the mean value theorem would not have applied. Uh, so, all right, so let's do it. So you're like, okay, so here's the open interval, right? They kind of like stated the conclusion. Let me see if I have the uh, the essentials that for me to even state the mean value theorem, right? What are the essentials? Those are the the, the, the hypothesis of the theorem. What is the hypothesis of the theorem? The function's got to be continuous and it's got to be uh, differentiable, but you know that it is because it said that it was, right? So it said that H, let me go back here, all right? It said that the height of the tree at time T is given by a twice differentiable function H. So there you go, bam. So we know that H is continuous, right? And we also know that H is differentiable. So those are the two needed ingredients to state the conclusion of the mean value theorem, right? Which states, therefore, all right, so this is like the hypothesis or the if part. This will be the then part, all right? Therefore, there's got to exist this C in this open interval 2 to 10, right? Such that the derivative of the function at this C value, all right, is equal to the slope of the secant line, which in this case would be h of 10 minus h of 2 over 10 minus 2. So again, these are all notes here. So this is your mean value theorem. So you're like, all right, well, let me do it, right? I basically stated that it's, gotta, it's gonna have to happen. And so now when I look at this problem, right, it said, explain why, well, if I go to do this, h prime of c, let me do this over here and make sure I get two because that, that's what has to happen. So H of 10, that's going to be 15, right? H of two, that's going to be one and a half. Uh, and 10 minus two, that's going to be eight. So that's going to be, let's see here, 13.5 over eight. All right. And I know it's a, it's a non-calc question and, you know, maybe you're, um, arithmetic skills aren't the greatest, but you're pretty sure that isn't two. So then this is like the snafu that they threw at us, right? Like, what's the deal? I didn't get two. How am I supposed to do this? So sometimes what you're going to have to do, all right, is all right, even though they gave you this open interval, you may have to search for an interval within this interval where you can apply this theorem and show that the derivative must be equal to two. So we use the whole thing here, right? Because that's the interval they gave us. But maybe there's an interval inside of this interval which guarantees me that the derivative must be two because then that would also guarantee me that there's at least one within that interval since we're talking about an interval within an interval. So all right, so you can mess around with it. You can kind of do it in your head, you know, like, all right, maybe I should do seven and three. And you get 11 minus two over seven minus three, and that ain't going to be two either, right? And you're like, well, maybe if I do five and three here. So in other words, let me clean this up, all right? First off, H is continuous on the open interval three, five. It's got to be because it told us it was twice differential. That also means that h is differentiable on the open interval 3 5. now i said open interval here for continuity but we usually define that in terms of closed interval so shame on me so it's continuous on the closed interval differentiable on the open interval all right so this we know this is definitely true and that's all from that given that h is twice differentiable well because of this right this is the hypothesis of the mean value theorem because of this we can state the conclusion which says, all right, there's got to exist a C on this open interval now, which I changed to 3, 5, such that the derivative at this C is going to equal the slope of the secant line. So H of 5 minus H of 3 over 5 minus 3. And so now I would do it. So I'd say, all right, H prime of C is H of 5, right? That's going to be 6, all right, minus H of 3. That's going to be 2 all over 5 minus 3, and then 6 minus 3 is 4, 5 minus 3 is 2, and look at that, right? We got the value of 2. So we are guaranteed. We're not asking you to find what that value is, right? I'm not, no one's asking you to find C, but we are guaranteed there's got to be at least one C within the interval. Now, 3, 5, which, oh, by the way, is also within 2, 10. 
such that the derivative is going to be equal to 2, all right? And that is by the mean value theorem. So by the mean value theorem. And the reason why I can state this, the only reason why I can state this is because I had those needed ingredients. The hypothesis was met, all right? So that's a nice little problem there, a nice little twist on something that I never gave you a problem like that in class ever. When we did mean value theorem problems, I gave you the interval and you applied it on that interval. You never had to think, well, it might not work with the points they're giving me in terms of what I want to show. So maybe I have to pick a sub interval within the interval, right? So that's a neat little thing there. All right, that's the type of stuff you can expect these uh, test creators to do to you. Uh, I love it. All right, so let's go to the next part of this question. All right, so this is pretty bread and butter. It says use a trapezoidal sum. So right off the bat, you should have things popping in your mind of what you're about to do. Four subintervals indicated by the data in the table. So probably not going to be uniform. It looks like they're not because this jumps up one, two, two, three. Um, to approximate the average height, so average being a key word here, of the tree on the time interval two to ten. Okay. So how do I find the average height of the tree? Well, if they give me or you know a, a height function, which is essentially that's what this is. It's a height function. And I have to find the average value of that function. All right, so there's good news here and better news. The good news is this is an easy question. All right, the better news is, is this is not going to be on your test. All right, this is one of the topics that they took off of this year's test. But we're going to do it just because, come on, it's not hard. All right, so here we go. So I want to find the average value of this function. So if you remember, because we actually did this, the average value of a function, not average rate of change, people, which would be slope of the secant line. The average value of a function over an interval a, b is 1 over b minus a integral a to b of f of x dx. So that is a little formula that, you know, you, you, we're supposed to know, all right? Although you're not supposed to know it because it's not on your test, all right? But that's the average value of a function. So now you're like, all right, so let me apply that to this particular problem. I want the average height, so I want the average value of this function, right? So h average over this interval, 210, is going to be 1 over 10 minus 2 integral from 2 to 10 of h of t dt, right? That would be the first thing that you write down. So then you're like, well, where does this whole trapezoidal sum stuff come into play? Well, because you don't have a function for h, right? You don't have an algebraic expression representing that function, nor do you have a graph. So you're not going to be able to do any sort of integration algebraically, and you're not going to be able to do any sort of net signed area type of thing uh, because you don't have the function, so to speak. You just have a table of values. So when that's a ca the case, we approximate the integral using either RAM or, in this case, trapezoidal. So we're going to approximate this with trapezoidal, okay? So let's go get them, all right? So here we go, and I'll kind of swing over to the left here because I'm going to have to write a bunch of stuff. So I'm going to get 1 over 10 minus 2 is 8, but now, and I'll switch this to blue, this is the part that I'm approximating with the trapezoidal. All right, so what's the deal? Hopefully you remember a couple of key notes here. This is not work that you would show, but the area of a trapezoid, right, is the average of the bases times the height, okay? That's a horrible H. So let me redo that. The average of the bases times the height, okay? That's how you find the area of a trapezoid. So how does that play out in the problems that we do, right? Because a lot of times we think base bottom, but that's not how it's going to look when you do these with, with uh, functions. So the area of a trapezoid, maybe another way to think of it would be, you know, one Y value, call it Y1, plus a second Y value over two, or you could do a half times. I don't know why I decided to switch it up to over two. And then times delta, to, uh, delta X or delta T, in this case, delta X, right? That's kind of how it plays out. Again, this is not necessary what I'm about to do, but I think it's a good visual so that when I start writing numbers over here, if you're not sure of how to do this, they should make sense to you. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to kind of plot these points. So I got one, two, three, and there's four, five, 
six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So those are the T values. All right, now I'm going to plot my H values. So my H values, let's see, at two, I'm at like one and a half. At three, I'm a little higher. At five, I'm at six. At seven, I'm at 11. At 10, I'm at 15. All right, so that's going to be like the graph of H of T. So you just have these dots here, right? But we know the function, even though we can't see it, is continuous, right? They told us it was twice differentiable. So if I could see it, then, you know, who knows? Maybe it looks, maybe it looks something like that. So now we want to approximate this integral. So yeah, we're going to approximate the net signed area under the curve right here. And since we don't necessarily know what this geometric shape is, it's kind of like a wonky uh, trapezoid. We're going to use trapezoids to approximate it. So using the sub intervals indicated in the table. So this trapezoid here, we're going to find the area of that. Then we're going to find the area of that trapezoid. Then we're going to find the area of this trapezoid. And then we're going to find the area of that trapezoid. And we're going to add them up. And that's going to represent an approximation for that integral. All right, so let's do it. So here we go. So the area, I'll call it, uh, you know, I'm going to call it anything. So let's do the area of the first trapezoid. So the area of the first trapezoid, it's going to be one half. Add up the bases. Now, the bases are your parallel sides. So those are your y values. That's where that came from. So your y values for 2 and 3 here are right here. I can see them in the table. All right, so that's going to be 1.5 plus 2. And now times the height. The height of the trapezoid is the, is the distance between the parallel sides, which that'll be your delta x in these problems. So that's 1. So this little formula here represents the area of the first trapezoid. Okay. So now I'm going to add that to the area of the second trapezoid. So that's going to be one half. All right. So now we're going to look at these bases here and figure out the area of that guy. So that's the base at three and five. So now I'm kind of like shifting over, right? So I just did this two and three, and now I'm doing three and five. Okay. And so, all right. So let's see here. So that's going to be, it looks like two plus six. 2 plus 6 times the, the height, which would be the change in this here. So that's going to be 2. There you go. All right. Add that now to the area of this trapezoid, this guy right there. All right. So now I'm going to use this, slide it over. So that's going to be 6 plus 11. Those are my height values, my parallel bases, times the height difference between 7 and 5 is 2. Okay. And then I'm going to add that to now that last trapezoid. So this guy right here, which again, if I'm just doing it in a table, I'm looking at that little thing where I overlap the 7 there. See that? So I'm going to get the heights. Be careful you add the right values here. The bases are your functional values. Say that out loud 15 times. The bases are your functional values. The bases are your functional values, right? They're the parallel sides. They're these guys here, those values, all right? And then times the distance between the parallel sides, which is your delta x, which is three. And there you have it, all right? Now you can mess with this. You can pull out a half because every, uh, every, you know, part, every part of the sum here has a half, whatever you want to do, right? This is a non-calculator question. Um, so however you want to do it at the end of the day, when you do it, you should get, you know, depending on how you do it, you may work it out to be 131.5 over 16. If you did it a different way or if you just copied the answer key, maybe you got 263 over 32. Remember, you weren't allowed to use a calculator here, so you're not expected to do that division. All right. So this represents the average value. Now, what would the unit for it be? Well, it's the average value of the function h, so the unit should be meters. So over this particular time interval, 210, the average height of the tree uh, 2 to 10, all right, uh, is going to be that many meters, all right? So there you have it, all right? It's like 8-something meters. And again, don't forget this 1 eighth, right? That's part of the average value formula here. That, that's a common mistake that people just do the trapezoidal approximation of the integral and they forget the actual formula. So when you do all this arithmetic, you're going to multiply by 1 eighth, all right? And there you have it. And so that is an approximation for the average value. Approximation because we use trapezoidal. All right, again, you know, the good news is the average value part of this is not going to be on your test, but the trapezoidal part of this can absolutely be on your test. All right, so see if you can kind of crunch out these numbers, get these numbers here without maybe taking the time 
to draw this graph if you know, especially if you're crunched on time. Uh, but I like drawing the graph when I explain it because it, to me it's like very obvious what the heck's going on. Sometimes if I just would have did this and showed the overlap and whatnot, you'd have no idea what the heck I was doing. All right, but here it kind of is clear. All right, let's go to the final question here. All right, awesome, awesome, awesome little question. So it says the height of the tree in meters can um, also be modeled by the function g given by this. So we know this function g, and I'm going to call it this way. Uh, I'm going to call it g of x, but it's called g. You'll see why in a second. Um, 100x over 1 plus x, so that's what they're giving us. It says x is the diameter of the base of the tree. All right, so that's just good to know. All right, so x is the diameter of the base of the tree. So, you know, here's this tree going up, and apparently that is being represented by x. It says when the tree is 50 meters tall, the diameter of the base of the tree is increasing at a rate of, right, rate of 0.03 meters per uh, year. It says according to this model, what is the rate of change of the height? So we want to know the rate of change of the height of the tree with respect to time in meters per year at the time when the tree is 50 meters tall. So you have to read this problem and you have to be like, <laughs> smells like a related rates problem, right? Because they're giving you rates. They're talking about with respect to time. So remember the whole process that we did with these, right? We would write down, well, what rates do we know and what rates do we want to find? So let me see here. My eyes go to 0 0.03 meters per year, 0 0.03 meters per year. That's a rate that I know. Now, what rate is that? It says the diameter of the base of the tree is increasing. So the diameter of the base. Oh, they told me X is the diameter. So that's the rate of change of x with respect to time. So that is dx dt, all right? And it says when the base of the tree, I'm sorry, when the, when the tree is 50 meters tall. So this isn't a constant rate. It's changing at this rate when the tree is 50 meters tall and the height of the tree can be modeled by g, right? That's what that says right here. So this is at the instant g equals 50, which that's a little disconnect, but that's okay for now. All right, now what do I want to find? It says, according to this model, what is the rate of change of the height? Well, the, again, g was the height. So we want to find dg dt at the instant g equals 50, okay? So normally we would draw a picture. We'd have to come up with an equation and then take the derivative of both sides with respect to time. Well, there's no need to really draw a picture here because they gave you the equation that relates g and x. So now how do you get things like dx dt and dg dt if you have an equation with g and x in it? Hopefully you're saying, oh, take the derivative of both sides with respect to time, treating g and x as functions of time, which by the way, they would be because they're both changing as time moves on, all right? So this is where I want to go. So you're like, okay, good little question. What's the derivative of g with respect to t? where g is a function of t, it would be dg dt. Notice I'm going with the, you know, the d do y dx notation, Leibniz notation here. I'm not going with the prime notation. I just happen to like to do that when I do related rates problems, all right? Just personal preference. If you want to write g prime of t here, uh, knock yourself out. All right, so now what's the story with this? Well, this is a quotient. How do you take the derivative of a quotient? You have to use the, you guessed it, quotient rule, right? Quotient rule says start where? Start in the bottom. So quotient rule in our own words is going to be the bottom times the derivative of the top. What is the derivative of 100x? All right, some of you might say 100. And if I said, what's the derivative of 100x with respect to x? You'd be correct. It's 100. But we're not asking you that. We're saying, what's the derivative of 100x with respect to t where x is a function of t? So that means that's stuff. So you have to apply the chain rule here. So it's going to be 100 times the derivative of stuff, or in this case, 100 times dx dt. So now that represents bottom times the derivative of the top. Now going along with the quotient rule here, I have to go minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. Now the bottom is a sum, the derivative of sum, sum of the derivatives, the derivative of 1, 0, the derivative of x. Again, you might say, oh, it's 1. I said the derivative of x with respect to x, you'd be correct. But if I said the derivative of x with respect to t, where x is a function of t, then it's going to be 1 times the derivative of stuff. So then 1 times the x dt. Again, that is the chain rule being utilized here. And then do not forget all over 
the bottom squared. All right, so you, that is the quotient rule on how to take the derivative of a quotient. So you have bottom times derivative of the top minus top times derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared. All right, some of you guys out there might do u's and d's and u dv minus v du over v squared, whatever it is. It's all the same nonsense. I like to memorize it this way. It's just my personal preference. All right, so here we go. Let's rock and roll. What do you do now? You have to chuck in what you know and solve for what you don't know. So this is kind of cool because I'm solving for dg dt at the instant g equals 50, right? So that's already kind of like solved for. Uh, but this is the, and I wouldn't call it a snafu, but this is something that we have to think about, right? All right, great. g equals 50. That's the instant. There is no g in this expression, right? So I need to figure out what x is at this instant. So think about what I'm saying here. I need to figure out what x is at the instant g equals 50 or at the snapshot g equals 50. So we have to kind of look at that snapshot. I mean, snapshot doesn't make maybe so much sense here when, when you're doing a problem like this, but maybe it does. Actually, I think it does. All right. So how do I figure out what X is at the snapshot when G equals 50? Well, if only you had an equation that related G and X, you do right here, right? So you're like, oh, okay. So let me plug 50 in here and let me figure out what X is when G is equal to 50. So let me figure out what the diameter of the tree is when the height of the tree is 50. That's the snapshot we're talking about here, right? So you have to solve that for x. So, you know, don't freak out, people, right? A little eighth grade math here. Cross multiply, multiply both sides by 1 plus x, however you want to think about it, right? When you do that, you're going to get, I'm going to distribute here right off the bat because I'm a little crunched for time um, and space. So I'm going to get 50 plus 50x equals 100x, right? Subtract 50x from both sides, and I get that. Divide by 50 on both sides, and whew, thank God, right? I thought these AP people were going to make me go nuts with arithmetic here. They didn't. So I get x is 1. So at the instant g equals 50, wherever I see an x, I can go ahead and chuck 1 in. So that's actually sweet, okay? And you're like, well, what are you chucking for dx dt? Well, they told you that dx dt at this particular snapshot or instant that we're looking at is 0.03. So I'm going to chuck in 0.03 for those two expressions there. Now, being that I want to be a little bit savvy here, uh, you know, not, not that this is even savvy, but I'm going to put in 3 hundredths, okay? So let's do this. So, and I'm not going to show the substitution step just because I'm, I don't feel like it. All right, so here we go. So we have 1 plus 1, that's going to be 2 times 100. And now, yeah, I could put in 0.03 here, but I'm going to put what 0.03 is, which is 3 hundredths, right? And then here I have 100 times 1. That's 100 times 3 hundredths. And then for the love of God, do not forget all over the bottom squared. 1 plus 1 is 2. 2 squared is 4. All right, so, you know, listen. Can I, we don't have a calculator here. The reason why I did this is because it's obvious to me now. Oh, I can cross those out. But quite honestly, it should be obvious that if you multiply – anything by 100, like 0.03, just move the decimal spot two places to the right, whatever. It's all the same nonsense. All right, so here we go. So let's let's compute this, all right? Two times three is six. Uh, this is all going to be three over four. So you get three-fourths, okay? What would the units be? Well, just look at your derivative here. G is measured in meters, right? G is measured in meters, all right? T is measured in years. So it's going to be meters per year, all right? So we're going to get that dg dt at the instant g equals 50 is going to be 3 fourths meters per year. So in other words, at the instant the tree is exactly 50 meters tall, okay? Um, or I can say at the instant the tree, the diameter of the base is exactly one meter, right? Because those are the same, uh, you know, same snapshots, same moments in time. The tree is growing, right? Because dg is the height. The height of the tree is changing or increasing by three fourths meters per year. All right, because that's what we got. Okay. Um, and let's just make sure we answer the question: What's the rate of change in height of the tree with respect to time meters per year at the time? Yeah. So there you go. All right. So always include the units. All right. Um, they didn't ask us to explain it, but I did, and that's that question. So again, awesome, awesome little question.
All right, hope everyone's good. Stay safe.